Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at episode one of a new Netflix miniseries called The Days. A miniseries about Fukushima. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard of Fukushima. That is when a earthquake and tsunami devastated Japan and East Asia back in 2011, including the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. This should be kind of like the Chernobyl series that is a few years old. But first, let's talk about Fukushima Daiichi. This is one of the largest nuclear power stations in the world at just under 6,000 megawatts. These reactors are General Electric boiling water reactors of a 1960s design. Boiling water reactors such as Fukushima, the fissions occur in the reactor core and the reactor press for vessel right here. Boiling actually occurs in this reactor, and the steam goes to the turbine to generate electricity. The steam is then recycled through a condenser, condensate flows through the feed water pumps, and is fed back into the reactor where it can be heated. This is a similar cycle to any other type of power plants. The only main difference is we're using nuclear fission to generate heat, to generate steam, to generate electricity. Now this is a much more robust design than Chernobyl with multiple strings of backup safety systems. And if you like strong, robust nuclear plant design, please support the clean nuclear energy future by liking, commenting, and subscribing and sharing. So how could there be an accident? Well, the plant was designed to withstand a 5.7 meter tsunami, and its emergency systems were placed 10 meters above sea level. The 2011 tsunami had a maximum height of 39 meters, and 14 meter high waves actually hit the plant. This is a six unit nuclear power plant. All right, here's the big picture. Units one through three at 100% power. Units four through six had a plan shut down. Unit one is an older, smaller design at only 460 megawatts. This is sad since they were actually planning on expanding this facility with units seven and eight before the earthquake happened. They mentioned you more being in a refueling outage. Outages are typically staggered so that some power is always being produced. That's not good. Earthquake. Unit one, emergency shutdown. Second unit, emergency shutdown. Unit one, all control rods are inserted. Second unit, all control rods are inserted. Units one and two, emergency shutdown confirmed. This is probably the most realistic reactor trip immediate actions I have ever seen in a movie or TV show. Good crisp communications. Saying reactor emergency shutdown, that is the first thing a reactor operator would do is ensure the reactor is shut down safely. And they would perform these actions immediately from memory. An earthquake would be a great reason to emergency shut down a reactor if they haven't done so automatically, which they have in this case. Now the way I was trained is the reactor operator would just say the high level steps, reactor has tripped, not going into control rods fully inserted, unless something wrong happened. The uh, senior reactor operator, control room supervisor, would not actually acknowledge until they're completely done with their immediate actions. Unless, of course, something went wrong. But now, this is just a normal reactor trip. Unit 1 has lost external power! Second unit has lost external power as well. Understood! Units! 1 and 2 have lost external power! Unit 1! MSIV closed! Second unit, MSIV closed! The loss of off-site power is the first casualty of the earthquake. Again, good immediate actions. The MSIV is the main steam isolation valve. Remember how water boils in a, the reactor pressure vessel in a boiling water reactor? This valve closing prevents steam from reaching the non-nuclear part of the plant. In addition, a total loss of off-site power, the units cannot send steam to their main condenser 
since the secondary loop is entirely shut down at this point. Unit 1, activating emergency diesel generator. Voltage is normal. More immediate actions. All emergency diesels should start within about 10 seconds or so. Each diesel by itself would power enough safe shutdown equipment to completely protect the core after shutdown. And there are at least two per unit in any nuclear power station. Though it shows the diesel starting before the lights actually come on. Um, it takes a couple of minutes for the diesel to actually sequence through all of its loads since um, each one of these is a large motor at start and you don't want to you don't want to overload the diesel too quickly. They say activating, but the e diesel generator is already activated at that point. Okay. They are safe for now. Hence the exhale. Check the reactor status, all right? Yes, sir. At this point, they should be in the procedures for reactor trip and for safe shutdown earthquake. This checks the reactor status and ensures the availability of all safety equipment. That is to say, are these emergency diesels actually doing their job? It'll also send plant operators to check on equipment that was damaged by the earthquake. I would also, in this case, have my reactor operators silence and acknowledge these alarms, because these alarms are our first clue as to where the damage has occurred, and we need to know which conditions have either just come in and cleared or are still in and we need to do something to address it. Each alarm actually has an alarm response procedure that the reactor operators will follow. Unit 1, emergency cooling, RC active. Second unit, emergency cooling, RCIC active. In this particular type of boiling water reactor, an RCIC or IC, that's reactor coolant, isolation condenser is the first line of defense for safe shutdown cooling. Even though it is still shut down, a reactor generates a lot of decay heat. Less than 1% of full power, but this is a nuclear reactor. 1% is still a lot. The condenser transfers this residual decay heat from the reactor coolant to the water in a heat exchanger into steam cooling off the reactor. This system is entirely passive, requiring no electrical power to operate. At this point, it looks like everything is okay. Hey, check Daini Nuclear Power Station 2. There is actually another Fukushima power station, Daini, which could actually withstand higher waves and it was further away from the highest waves. There's a reason why you might not have ever heard of it, because they were just fine. They did shut down, but no fuel damage ever occurred at that plant. Hey, they got this right. 10 meters above sea level. Excuse me, sir. Hey. All nuclear reactors from units 1 to 3 are shut down. IC and RCIC are operating. They can activate the HPCI if necessary. The HPCI is High Pressure Coolant Injective, otherwise known as Safety Injection. This is the second line of defense. They use an external source of water to keep the reactor cooled and covered. There is also a Low Pressure Coolant Injection, they are typically operated together um, in case of a reactor coolant pressure drop. High pressure, low volume, low pressure has high volume. Though these pumps do require electricity to operate, but they are powered by the emergency diesel in case of a loss of normal power. Also in this scene, you see they use TOEPCO instead of TEPCO, probably to avoid lawsuits. The real company is TEPCO or Tokyo Electric Power Company. Over 55 degrees per hour. It's cooling too quick. Cut off the IC? Yeah. So you're probably wondering why cooling down too quickly can be bad. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, this reactor has a negative moderator temperature coefficient. Fancy word, but that means if you cool down too quickly, the reactor could actually restart. You don't want that. Now the risk of that in this situation is still very low, but they're still outside of operator band, and the operator just want additional safety margin. You never have too much. And two, fast cooldowns carry an increased risk of brittle fracture in the reactor pressure vessel, which would lead to a loss of cooling accident. Don't want that either. 
That's why they would cycle the um, IC's isolation valve in order to control the uh, flow of coolant. Again, this guy should really tell their operators to <laughs> acknowledge their alarms. The risk of both of these for momentarily exceeding a ban is still very low. Though. Thermal power stations in Hamadori, Hitachi Naka, Kashima, and Chiba have shut down. As of 22 hydroelectric stations. One thing people forget is how devastating the earthquake was to all industry and infrastructure, not just the nuclear plant. Almost 20,000 people would die in this earthquake at Sinan. Oh man, this is really bad. Always these guys that just stand and watch when something like this happens. Amazing how destructive a column of water can be. Water. What the heck? So these guys are in a basement. This is a completely unrealistic scene, by the way. I've never heard a plant operator say, what the heck? They always say something much worse. Hmm? Um, that's odd. You also stuck! <laughs> that's a crazy design. I've never seen a security portal where you can actually get stuck. If the device mouse functions, you just couldn't get in. This is a claustrophobic nightmare and water's coming in soon. the electrical equipment. Should have built it higher up, I guess. Silence, acknowledge, and reset. That way, when something happens next, you'll be ready and not having all of those flashing lights. Silencing will make the noise stop. Acknowledging, you'll see which conditions are in that need to be addressed and which conditions have cleared. And resetting makes the lights go away. Operator fundamental beaten into every operations crew during simulator training. Wow, CCTV of a plant. We didn't have that in my control room. They should probably be looking at that. Ugh, what a mess. This is a nightmare scenario. Water levels are normal in the reactors. And pressure, also normal. I hope they've not lost power yet. We saw those electrical bays and diesel rooms get flooded. They are isolated. Think of a nuclear control room as a fortified bunker. There are no windows, so they can't actually see much of the devastation until they find out their equipment starts breaking. Ooh, looks like they just lost control power. Control power, at least for important safety systems, is actually DC power, just from batteries. So even on a total loss of AC power, all their diesels um, get lost they would still have the ability to control the most important equipment. But it actually looks like they lost that first. Emergency diesel generator, inactive. Oh, now they just lost the diesel too. How are the lights still on? What did you say? Okay, there they go. Electricity just paused for a dramatic read. It actually looks like they lost both AC power and DC power. So that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> now they should actually have some light left in the control room battery backed lights that are similar to the ones you see in hospitals so what do you do now well every safety system must be operated locally and manually and the station's biggest priority would be bringing in new generators to restore power by any means necessary easier said than done given the entire region just got destroyed SBO SBO SBO. SBO means station blackout or a total loss of AC power. But again, they're actually experiencing something way worse, a loss of both AC and DC power. So that's a major escalation for their emergency plan. What do you mean? Our external power supply was cut off as a result of the earthquake. The tsunami that followed completely flooded the area, reaching 10 meters above sea level, which is where the nuclear reactors are. The diesel generators shut down because they were waterlogged. That was actually a good explanation. Even without power, the IC should operate, right? 
I can't really say. While the IC is passive and should work, the control room would have no way of actually verifying its operation, since they just don't have visibility of what's going on in the plant, let alone being able to control it. Also, those spent fuel pools are starting to heat up at this point, because uh, they require electricity to operate those pumps. In for this situation. And they really wouldn't have had any training. There is a station blackout procedure, but the main actions for that are try to restore power by any means necessary, verify IC and other safety systems operation, which they can't really do without any lights or control power, and load shed to extend the life of their DC control power, which again is gone. And that's about it for station blackout procedures that existed in 2011. However, at this time, there's no evidence of radiation leaking out to the atmosphere. That's a true statement. Everything is completely contained. For now. Nothing in here anticipates a total station blackout. Three Mile Island and Chernobyl had power... Three Mile Island, but Chernobyl lost everything after they caused their own accident. They did have some vis visibility before it actually happened. But I get what he's saying. TMI had a good design, but bad operators. Chernobyl had a bad design and bad operators. Fukushima, by most standards for the time, had a great design and good operators, but they didn't anticipate this big of an earthquake and tsunami. And that's basically where episode one ends. But before I let you go, I want to talk a bit more about all the changes that have happened to the industry ever since Fukushima. Worked at in Texas underwent major design changes after Fukushima. This included a whole new category of equipment called flex. Flex equipment consisted of on-site equipment, such as backup diesels to our three already existing emergency diesels located on the roofs of 30 plus meter tall buildings and temporary pumps and hoses to keep the reactor and spent fuel pools cool. In addition, there were remote facilities where additional equipment can arrive in a matter of hours by helicopter in case all of this equipment gets destroyed. In other words, we had backup systems for our backup systems for our backup systems. And note that this wasn't just for tsunami-borne prone areas. There's no initiating event that caused this. Every nuclear power plant in the U.S. is ready for something like this. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.